Hi folks, Roach here, still in the woodshed. I'm doing this video, <clears throat> why am I unhappy? Um, because I, I, I believe my personal explore, uh, exploration uh, is actually very helpful uh, to others. And if you understand <clears throat> why I'm unhappy, <clears throat> you may find that you're unhappy for the same reasons okay so that's why I'm doing this and uh, um, and I, I'm not going to speak to anybody's unhappiness um, this is something that you have the responsibility to explore for yourself uh, exercise courage and I think it's worthwhile to find out why if you don't know why you have no chance of ever getting to a point where you can be happy the reason it takes courage is for me personally that trip took me through the depths of what's inside and I was shown some things about what's inside that are extremely uncomfortable to come to grips with <clears throat> and when I asked that question why am I unhappy there, there I had many different false starts because quite frankly um, I wasn't really ready to know and I was actually afraid to find out and although the answers uh, a lot of the times were right in front of my face uh, I, I couldn't see them because I was afraid. Um, however, in looking back at this process, uh, I am uh, pleased and happy that I went through that process. Um, I am not in a position of doubt. I know exactly what the problem is or was. And um, I... I I know how to correct it. All right. <clears throat> so why was I unhappy? You know, I was miserable. Um, I had all the stuff in that you know that supposed to make you happy, but didn't make me happy. Uh, these things out there weren't making me happy. People, money, that kind of stuff just just wasn't doing it for me. Because when I had that stuff, I wasn't happy. So obviously, th my happiness wasn't going to come from s s some kind of object. That the happiness actually was in me, and I, I got to find out why, what's wrong. Long story short, I actually found out that what my problem was was I was a criminal. I had committed a crime. And it's actually the worst crime a man can do, ultimately, or anyone can do to themselves, because it is done to yourself. And the reason why it's the worst crime is because when you commit a crime against yourself, there's no one you can go to to ask for forgiveness. You're always taken right back to the same place. However, the problem with the crime, too, is I didn't even know I was doing it. Although I was suffering the consequences in my experience, and, you know, you know here's the law. You know, if you've committed a crime, and you can't even acknowledge that crime then you can't expect to be in a position of happiness because you've got an unhandled issue an unacknowledged crime can't be forgiven 
because it hasn't yet been reconciled. You can't get to a point of forgiveness without knowing that you're committing a, a crime. And me, I committed a crime against myself. And it was a very subtle crime. And I didn't know what that crime was. And, and, and for me to know what that crime was, I had to be shown. Not only did I have to be shown, but I had to accept what I saw. And what I saw was really ugly. I'm going to relate an incident that, that's out there that most people don't really realize occurred because uh, it happened a long time ago. And, and the, the odd thing about things that happen a long time ago is, you know, they're just not that important to us. And and you will and the reason I'm relating this old old incident uh, is because the similarities about what happened to me recently in 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 my history are almost the parallels are unbelievable. Coincidentally, it's the same. It it, it is the same thing. What I'm talking about is the Ludlow Massacre that happened in Colorado, and it happened in 1914, on April 20th, the day after Easter. Um, April 20th is an interesting date. Uh, apparently, it's a terrible day for human beings. <laughs> um, um, so, that's... That's the problem. So the Ludlow Massacre basically was miners in, coal miners in Colorado were fed up with the working conditions at the mine. They were fed up being overworked like dogs. And they said, hey, we, we won't work until you guys actually correct the problems. I don't think that that's unreasonable. Because at no time did anybody actually come out and say, oh no, you're wrong. They just didn't correct the conditions. Well, the miners themselves had had enough. So, you know, in a period of about a year, there, there, uh, there was striking, and, and this is starting to affect people's profit margins. You know, why can't they just go back to work and just accept the fact that, you know, hey, you know, a death here and there uh, because of the working conditions, you know, that's just a part of, you know, what they're supposed to do for us. O eventually what happened was the National Guard was called in, plus some hired thugs by the mining companies. And they uh, shot, beat, and burned to death dozens of men, women, and children. And it did create an outrage there. However, the thing that I thought was pretty interesting was who were these mining companies and who ran them? And why was that important? Now, they had a bunch of hearings as to actually the cause. And, and technically it was uh, a, 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 bunch of ir a, a bunch of responsible people hired a bunch of irresponsible people with guns. And those irresponsible people with guns were turned loose on you and I and killed you and I for people who were responsible. Now, are irresponsible with guns the problem? No. It is irresponsible people. It is, you know, people who say they're responsible hiring irresponsible people with guns. With no oversight at all. 
and not just no oversight all right so uh, you know uh, the guy who ran you know one of the principals of the mining company okay uh, of the mine there were a number of different mining companies but this guy's name should be familiar to you in that uh, his name was John D Rockefeller senior um, it, that should be very familiar to you and he testified uh, at at uh, uh, you know some hearings uh, conducted in Washington and he testified he says uh, he, uh, uh, John, uh, you know, they, they heard testimony of all the principals, uh, including John D. Rocker, uh, Rockefeller, Sr., who testified that even after knowing that guards in his pay had committed atrocities against the strikers, he would have taken no action to prevent his hirelings from attacking them. Now, you and I have a responsibility. So let's just say that you're a parent, or if you're anybody, and you decide that you're going to hand a razor blade to a three-year-old kid. They will put you in jail because you violated the law. what law is it it's called criminal negligence when you put a dangerous object in an irresponsible man uh, uh, into anybody who's irresponsible then you commit a crime especially when that results in an injury just handing the razor blade to the three-year-old kid itself is not a crime but generally what happens when a three-year-old kid has a razor blade? There's, crim there's damages. There's an injury. It's a crime. Those in positions of power have a responsibility to comport themselves in a responsible manner. So if you're John D. Rockefeller Sr. and you hire people to go and commit atrocities against other people and you're the one that's funding that then I don't believe that you need to be in control of any kind of assets because what you've done is just demonstrated to everybody that you yourself are irresponsible and you are certainly not a man that should be in control of a certain amount of wealth and by engaging that you've demonstrated that you are uh, irresponsible therefore you do not have rights and without rights you cannot have property because you don't own property without responsibility uh, but given what Mr. Rockefeller did I would suggest that the proper treatment is to actually uh, walk him outside and tie him to a tree hanging from his tie that's the correct way given given what these guys did that would ensure that these guys wouldn't do it again but see society decided to sweep that car carcass under the rug and wow lo and behold if we're not dealing with the same reprobates now that we were dealing with then wow they had children Oh gosh, now there's more of them. Do you think their behavior changed after society decided to just say, I guess that's okay, yeah, we'll let you do that without you know any kind of meaningful punishment. Society then just sets the precedent that that's the kind of behavior that, they're, that they expect. So, you know, any time that you want to complain about your working conditions, some thugs were going to come and, you know, murder you. Because you said it's okay. 
And when you say it's okay to do that to you, then you commit a crime against yourself. So, you know, in and around 99, I'm asking the question, okay, why am I unhappy? So, <clears throat> didn't take very long. I actually saw a program called Rules of Engagement, which actually presented something that happened not very far from here. Probably been an hour or two from here. In a place called Waco, Texas. And that happened on April 19th of 1993, uh, which is odd because it's sort of like on an anniversary of the Ludlow Massacre. That was the culmination of, you know, I don't know how, I can't remember how many day siege they had, where what was called the Branch Division were holed up in their compound. Uh, and 85 people were, men, women, and children were burned to death. And... I, you know, at the time, I basically said, you know, I, I, I believe what I was told about Mr. Koresh and in the fact that, you know, he was just, you know, a pervert and, and you know, a gun dealer and, you know, a, a malcontent and a miscreant and just quite frankly not doing what he is supposed to do. However that program actually showed me a side of David Koresh that I thought was kind of interesting. Enough to say, hmm, why in the world did the federal government decide it was a good idea to hire a bunch of irresponsible people, uh, irresponsible people with guns when it, was, it wasn't even necessary to do that? See, David Koresh didn't exist in a compound uh, David Koresh was a man out in the open, was in town all the time, and if you had a problem with David Koresh, you could just walk up and talk to him and say, hey, you know, we, you know, we'd like to question you. And David Koresh was nice enough to actually do that. In fact, um, David Koresh, uh, he, he, he believed in, in, in rights, and he says, you know, he has a right to bear arms, and that right was not going to be infringed. And he had the right to engage uh, in any business that he chose, and and, the, uh, and their chosen business was to sell guns, which really wasn't a problem because, you know, those rights were there. And, you know, certainly at the time, I can't say what's happening right now, but at the time it was, uh, it was uh, lawful and legal for him to do that. And I say legal because David Koresh had all the appropriate permits to do what it was that he did. Not that he really needed permits from the U.S. government, but he had them anyway. And he, can sell, he could sell any type of small arms that, that he chose. And in fact, the government actually kind of liked that, or at least certain groups in the government actually liked to do that, or let's just say certain groups tangential to the government, because the relationships here are intentionally foggy. So... One day, a bunch of guys loaded up on the back of the truck ends up showing up at David Koresh's door. And then apparently some shooting erupted. Now, see, we don't get to know who shot first uh, because we've never actually been given any evidence either way. Which I think is kind of odd, because if there was evidence that actually demonstrated that David Koresh shot first, or if there was an amount of re uh, if people who actually, you know, saw the any evidence and testimony um, could reasonably conclude that there's probably a good chance that, that um, David Koresh was the aggressor, then I'm sure that those people um, would have done that first. But see, we don't know what happened because nobody's actually released any of that information such that we could do that. See, what we're doing is we're given a line here saying, oh, this, 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 and this happened. Um, and you're just going to have to believe us because, you know, we are the government. Why would we lie? 
My question is, why would you tell the truth? It seems to me, <clears throat> what I saw was criminal negligence. Okay, if, if you could pick up David Koresh off of the street and question him any time because he's open, he's not hiding, then why didn't you just do that? Why did you load a bunch of guys on the back of a truck with guns such that you intentionally created a uh, an opportunity for a violent conflict? Who was the civilized man here? And, and who was the criminal? Well, David Koresh, um, it, you know, if you want to argue that David Koresh shouldn't have, uh, uh, you know, used firearms, well, you know, I don't know if, the, if a bunch of goons show up at your doorstep with guns and start shooting at you, then what are you supposed to do? Let them? You know, it's one of those things where I come down and say, mm, you know, prove it. But what happened actually on on April twenty uh, April nineteenth, nineteen ninety three, was they burned these people to death, and the people that were left were so intimidated by what they saw that I'm sure that they cooperated and said anything that these goons wanted them to say. So really, I can't uh, I can't say anything more than the testimony or anything that actually came out about it that reinforced the government's viewpoint on this incident is probably compelled and therefore not admissible in a court of law but apparently in public opinion that that, that duty isn't there we're not discriminating against uh, we're not very discriminating um, so I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying to figure out well, what in the world what would cause the government to behave that way, right? I, I, and guess what? I, I'm I'm let I, I'm free to speculate all I want because guess what? The you know those people that have a responsibility to actually uh, divulge the information actually haven't done that. So that leaves me pretty free to actually try to uh, try to determine by what they don't say and what I do know to actually determine what actually occurred. Now, uh, Mr. Koresh was very cooperative in, uh, initially with the government. Uh, he actually uh, was happy to actually house uh, government agents uh, supervising his activity on his own property, in the property of the Branch Davidian Church. He housed them, took care of them, provided what they needed so that they could know that what he was doing was really there was nothing wrong with it, and he wasn't hiding or doing anything that was criminal. Now, there was some testimony that came out from a 14-year-old girl that said that they were molested. And, oh, okay, that's, that's, re okay, that's fine. And, and, and let's just assume for, for the sake of argument that David Koresh was actually molesting girls. Okay? Of course, the sheriff couldn't arrest him because the sheriff says, you know, I have no evidence of that. And if I'm going to arrest him, I have to have evidence. Otherwise, that's it's against the law. So the sheriff wasn't wasn't doing it. But you know, here come these guys, the BATF, and the, you know they, they they come in and they're serving a sexual, you know, uh, molestation warrant. That's not even their jurisdiction. All right. So th there's a lot of stuff that's really fishy about that. But I'm not going to. What I do know is this. Uh, the federal government has a responsibility to comport themselves in a responsible manner to ensure at all times that uh, people are not injured through its activities. They failed in that duty. That's criminally negligent. All right? And not only that, but there was no real substantive determination of who actually was responsible because apparently it was just the guys with guns that were responsible. Oh, Janet Reno took responsibility for it. But quite frankly, because she said that she took responsibility doesn't actually mean that she was responsible for it. And, and again, we really don't know who actually facilitated it. But again, I'm going to look at the situation of what David Koresh was and what the government did. Or maybe it was something else. But guess what? If the government 
uh, doesn't actually pursue it to the point where I'm satisfied with the conclusions and I'm not satisfied. And they don't come clean on any of this stuff. Then I'm at liberty to look at what they don't say and say, hmm, there's probably criminal activity because if it wasn't criminal activity, they'd be happy to show us all that it wasn't. But they can't. Or they won't. I'm guessing they can't. All right. So what do I think was going on? Well, David Koresh sold guns, and he sold, and, and the Branch Davidians, they sold a lot of guns. It's how they built their compound. You know, it's a church. You know, they have facilities. Hey, you know, uh, say what you want. I mean, let's just say, uh, you know, a lot of the buildings they constructed weren't particularly aesthetically pleasing. They, they, they were certainly uh, prag uh, practical uh, and, and utilitarian. You know, I wouldn't say that they were, you know, uh, grand, you know, cathedrals. I mean, they were boxes, you know. So, yeah, if you want to call it a compound, then, then you go ahead and do that. Uh, so, <clears throat> David Crash and Brent Davidian sold guns all over Texas, all over the air, this whole area. And they sold a lot of them. And the interesting thing about these guns, they're largely owned by other people, and they, they traded them. Now, <clears throat> what if there was a particular group of people that needed a large volume of guns of that particular type? Now, what else was going on there? Well, we do know that at that time, there was a lot of activity by, a, uh, by certain groups within the government, apparently with the government's blessing, going down to Central America and effectively trying to corner the drug trade and influencing, you know, governments, uh, you know, death squads without guns are really meaningless. So death squads actually need guns, you know, in order to cause death. Because, you know, really it's kind of stupid to run around with a bunch of knives if the populace down there actually has guns because, you know, you, you pretty much need guns. Now, it would be really uncomfortable for, you know, the federal government if, you know, all of these death squads are running around with M16s or any guns that, that you know, could be traced back to the United States. So they needed a, in order to do that, you know, it, you know, it, if you want to do that in secret, you don't want a bunch of people running around with M16s or, you know, government issued guns because they, you look at the guns and say, well, you know, hey, we know where these are coming from. <gasps> so they needed guns that were probably private guns, you know, you know, people that, you know, rifles they, they use for hunting and, and stuff like that. Stuff that couldn't be traced back to a state actor. David Koresh, these guys, they were open for business. I believe it, their business included areas of Arkansas because it's not really that far from, from where Waco is. And what was going on in Arkansas? The governor at the time was Bill Clinton. Hmm. Interesting. And apparently, from what we can gather, is in Mena, Arkansas, there was a gun-running operation to supply, uh, quote-unquote, freedom fighters down in Central America. David Koresh, he likes freedom. Yeah, he was a patriotic American, you know, probably to an excess. You know, say what you want about him. He, you know, he, he believed in America and believed in rights and freedom. So I'm sure he was probably on board with helping, helping, you know, the freedom fighters fight communism down there. Except he was probably involved to the extent where he probably got wind of what it was really about and figured out that it was really not about fighting communism and it was really not about freedom and it was about actually selling cocaine in the United States. Selling guns is one thing. Fighting for freedom is one thing. Addicting all of the young people in the United States is something that David Koresh wouldn't be on board with. And if he found that out, he would tell all of the people in the church that 
agents of the government were involved with cocaine trafficking and gun running. Now that would be some dirty laundry that people in the government really would not want aired. And if David Koresh was freely discussing this sensitive information, then he would become a pretty big liability to the, the powers that be. Now who was, who was involved in this? Well, Barry Seals, one of the guys that was involved in a lot of this, basically said that uh, uh, when he, he actually testified against uh, some of the, uh, the drug cartels, you know, he, he was asked by reporters, uh, he says, aren't you afraid of, uh, 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 of these cartels? Aren't you afraid of these people? And he says, no, what I'm really afraid of is George Bush. That was George Herbert Walker Bush, Elder Bush. He says, we know that he was involved in that freedom fighting down there. That was what was called Iran-Contra. Yeah. So th these guys were heavily involved in this stuff. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush actually made this statement in 2009, in, in June, of, June 12th of two, 2009. He says, if the American people ever, fi ever find out what we have done to them, they will chase us down the streets and lynch us think he's telling the truth? I think he is. I'll take him at his word. Now that wasn't the crime. <clears throat> that was the incident. Now this guy, David Koresh, I mean they, they had him holed up in that compound, compound, right, for months. Like I think 80, at least 88 days or something like that. And he was denied any access to any media or anybody who could verify what, what had occurred. And the reason he was disconnected from talking to the media is because I suspect that the government was actually the one that initiated the violent conflict. They went there to kill those people, and nothing less than killing everybody and completely subjugating the survivors was going to do for them. Now, what happened after that? Well, they swept that carcass under the rug, just like they did the Ludlow incident. Here, here, here was David Koresh saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk to the media. Denied. So on April 20th, um, I run a file from the same people. And basically, what did I want? Well, I want to do process. This guy sends me this notice of levy and he says, hey, um, you know, uh, we're going to take this from you. So I just ask a simple question and it was, okay, uh, you're going to take property of mine? And I don't see a judge's signature on this document, and I don't see any authority on this document. I'm not going to just simply accept that. Oh, this is something that I should do. And I read the I read the terms and conditions on the back, and I says, "Oh well, um, what am I agreeing to here? You know, don't do this until you explain what this what this is truly about." And what gives you the authority to do that? Now, that's a reasonable question. That is a question that everybody has the responsibility to ask. Because quite frankly, uh, if you join the military, uh, it's a contract to allow other people to throw you in front of a moving car whenever they decide to. And they will do that or they'll shoot you. And I'd like to know that if I agree to this contract and subject myself to it, am I agreeing to just simply throw myself in front of a moving car or throw myself off a cliff or drown myself in the sea? I want to know the authority because, wow, lo and behold, I've spent a long time trying to figure out 
how the federal government does what it does. I've even asked the federal agents of the federal government time and time again, time and time again, okay, can you demonstrate by what a, a lawful authority? Now, every search that I make actually demonstrates to me the opposite. So over and over, I, I can't find the answer. So I have a legitimate question. Could you please tell me why you have the power to take property from me without a judgment, without, without a judge, after a determination of 12 of my peers? As that is the law. You don't take property from me unless it's determined that I am guilty of a crime or in breach of a contract. So I ask, could you please demonstrate that contract? Because, see, I don't remember actually getting into a contract. And I don't remember you actually providing the terms of that contract. In all of my searches, uh, you know, I got nothing. In fact, all of my searches say, wait a minute, there's something really unusual here. Would you please clarify where you get your lawful authority to do this? Now, that's a reasonable question. Posed by a reasonable man who was very willing to just sit down with, with people who you know, wanted to do this. And I would listen to anything that they actually said. And I would have evaluated what, what they said and given them every opportunity to do so. Not only did they refuse, but they did it anyway. And I warned them not to because I'd served them a presentment saying, hey, don't do that because you're violating my right to due process. Well, sort of like David Koresh or sort of like the miners at the Ludlow incident. It was like, you do what we tell you to do or we'll just kill you. feeling better? Could this be the source of your unhappiness? It was certainly a source of my unhappiness. Okay, So I'm being shown the same things that happened at the Ludlow massacre, the same things that happened in Waco. It's basically the government coming in and saying, you're going to do this or we're going to kill you. We'll beat you, we'll torture you, we'll burn you and your children to death. So it's a good idea if you voluntarily cooperate. See, that's what's called coercion. Okay? So, <clears throat> in, in seven months, nobody's actually come through with this, you know, and I uh, actually got involved with the Round Rock Police Department with a police officer said he was going to protect me and help me. And he says he'd like to arrange a meeting between me and the Internal Revenue Service so that, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, you know, so that we can negotiate and, and have a fair hearing about some of my questions. Get my questions answered. Right, so, and then they, they said, okay, well, uh, you know, for, for us to actually do this negotiation, the, the, you know, the people at the IRS are a little uncomfortable that, you know, you own guns and stuff, and, and, and th they're afraid you might commit an act of violence. And I said, oh, well, if that's all it is, here, take my guns for free. No obligation. Here's all my ammunition. You just go ahead. And then one day, all the police officers came to my house, and I showed them where all it was, and they carried it right on out. Because I thought it was worth it. It's a fair trade. If you're going to set up a negotiation to actually, after seven months, answer the legitimate questions that I had reasonably and peacefully, then, hey, it was well worth giving my guns to them. Right? Just to show them that, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not a kook. I'm not violent. Right? I'm certainly not going to fly my plane into a building. Okay? I'm certainly not going to hire a bunch of goons, show up to somebody's house, and shoot them all. Certainly won't do that. Or a bunch of goons to go through and just walk through and burn people to death. Not required. Not important. I'm just not even there. That's what uncivilized criminals do, and I'm not an uncivilized criminal. The whole idea of civilized is a pretty interesting notion, and, and, and we're going to get to that. All right, so this guy, uh, so, so finally they said, well, you have to show up on, on November 28th 
or bad things are going to happen to you. And the reason why is because when I showed up to that negotiation, right, two agents from the Treasury, one named Tryon and another named Keith, okay, actually entrapped me. See, what they did is they committed a fraud, which is a crime. Okay, they said that they that the, uh, the uh, IRS would come to negotiate and get some of my questions answered, such that I could present evidence of the crime that they committed uh, against me in April. Uh, crimes like extortion, theft, coercion, okay, witness tampering, obstruction of justice, um, fancy words like hypothecation. Yeah, that's really fancy. It means stealing and lying and fraud okay those kind of crimes you know so we were having a negotiation so these guys lied to me and defrauded me into showing up because i'd already to told jerry castleberry from the round rock police department i do not need to meet with my thief and beg for with for my money back i'm not going to do that and that's precisely what they set up and they did that by defrauding me by lying to me and misrepresenting the, this meeting as a negotiation. When I walked in there and I talked to this guy, Ronald Forster, I saw a dead man. He didn't have any, there wasn't anything living in him. I, 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 he's not even an animal. I would characterize him as a device. Not living at all. He gave me the absolute crepes. And basically, I started thinking that you know we were there for a negotiation. He basically said, no, no I, I don't need to hear your philosophy. Okay. I don't need to hear your philosophy. And I've heard it all before. But I wasn't talking about a philosophy. I was talking about the fundamental lawful authority that gave him the right to do what it was that he did. So if he doesn't want to hear my philosophy, and if he, if he doesn't want to know the law that gives him the power to do what it was that he's done, and, and the actual deliberate uh, criminal acts that his organization perpetrated, then that's not it. And, and if you want to call what I'm talking about the law philosophy, and you want to say that your procedures supersede the law, then that's blasphemy. So he served me with papers, a summons to appear on, on November 28th. And basically, uh, I told Jerry at Round Rock, who called me the day before, and I says, no, I'm not going to meet with that man. And he says, well, there, you know, there's going to be consequences for that. I says, well, shoot, if, if, the, if you know, agents from the U.S. Marshal Service come to pick me up, then that will be the first time I've actually witnessed somebody properly executing procedures according to their duty. It'll be a refreshing change from what I'm seeing here, where I can't even get people to answer a simple question. So I said, yeah, no big deal. So he says, oh my gosh, you know. So he says, well, I'll call Tryon and find out, you know, uh, find out what she, you know, uh, what she wants to do. I'll, I'll call you back this afternoon. Guess what? Didn't call me back. So guess what? I wasn't going to show up to that thing on the 28th. No way. I am not going to sit down and and, and place a vile abomination in front of me. Sorry. See if you can drag me there against my will, because I don't consent. So he hands me the summons, and I say, I don't consent to it. I don't agree. I basically told him there, I'm not showing up. He says, I don't care. We'll just have to, because U.S. Marshals come and collect you. And I says, well, okay, yeah, let, let, let's do that, right? So... So on Friday, I, I, I got these return receipt requested, things from, you know, some sort of government, federal government agency, law enforcement, real, real fancy stuff. And uh, this time I said, I, I want some names. So I, I, I signed the receipts under duress, put a UD on it. So quite frankly, you know, I, I'll, I'll take your 
you know, hey, look, you've already committed a crime. Uh, you know, if you're going to try to force me into uh, serve into in, in you know a uh, 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 presentment, you can go back to my presentment, which I serve with two witnesses, and you can clarify that and get that straightened out first. Then, then we'll go and we'll talk about this crap you sent me. So he sent me this nice letter, and you know, this is it. Um, and he, he sent me his card, right? And his name is Daniel Nikon Price. Okay, so here is his card. Okay, get a good look. All right. Right there's his there's his office phone number, right? So I thought it was kind of curious because the Treasury Department told me that uh, the U.S. Treasury has no business with the IRS. Well, um, why did the Treasury agents actually set up lawful service with the IRS if they didn't have any business? And why did they come and talk to me on April 10th, uh, trying to determine if I was a threat? Uh, seems to me that they have business. Okay, so now we've got a criminal agency called the IRS that committed extortion and, and theft, slander and all kinds of crap against me. Uh, and these guys tried to pretend uh, that they weren't involved. Unfortunately, their actions demonstrated that they are in, that they have conspired to commit a crime against me. All right? And you know, here again, okay, so now I've got Treasury implicated. I also have the Attorney General Office of Texas implicated in this criminal act. I also have uh, the uh, Travis County District Attorney's Office and the Travis County Sheriff and, um, wow, uh, all of the judges here in Williamson County, all of the local government officials, uh, all of those people all the way up the chain where I actually sought reasonable relief uh, and just wanted to question why can these guys just commit a crime and, and nobody does anything about it. You know, it's actually a pretty good question. Good question. I, I would think that anybody would want an answer to that. All right, so, you know, I get this letter, right? You know, I, and I, I called him up and left a message on his phone. And I says, you know, you, you've been sort of implicated, you know, as, as conspiring uh, to commit a crime here. And I, and I just want to, you know, give you an opportunity to, to you know, reconcile that issue for me. And I was willing to, you know, just actually talk to him and, and, and just, you know, let him know what actually occurred uh, because th this is not a, an issue of just some kook out here who doesn't want to pay income taxes. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is something a little bit deeper, like, okay, um, if I'm to pay income taxes, exactly what am I agreeing to here? What other implied contractual arrangements are required for my willing participation in your system. Okay, so it basically says, you know, I missed the uh, the 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 the, uh, the administrative hearing uh, with Mr. Ronald Forster, and uh, he says. Uh, the area manager of the Internal Revenue Service has notified this office that you have not complied with the provisions of summonses served on October 16, 2012. That's right. I didn't. As you recall, the summonses required you to appear before Ronald off, uh, uh, Revenue Officer uh, Ronald G. Forster on November 28th. Well, you know, the odd thing about me, when you hand me a stupid piece of paper, I actually read the thing. Right? So I read the summons, and I determined that he's, they weren't talking about me, because they were, they were talking about uh, me producing documents, uh, which is a violation of my, my rights. I'm, I don't, my business, none of your business. Um, and and, and they, it was founded under some gasoline tax thing. Well, see, gasoline or gasoline sales of gasoline is subject to an apportioned tax, right? However, income tax is an unapportioned direct tax, and they're not the same. So, if you can require people who sell gas to produce documentation, that doesn't translate across to an unapportioned direct tax. It also addressed something called a person, and I know enough about the law to know that they're talking about a corporation. Well, I'm not a corporation. In fact, it's against the law for me to be a corporation. So I determined the summons had nothing to do with me at all. So I didn't show up. Of course, why would I? 
Not only that, but the fact that I do show up means that I've voluntarily given Ronald Forster an abomination before the face of, you know, the one creator God in the universe, uh, a vile blasphemer, uh, jurisdiction over me. You know, I'm just not with that. You know, I'm just, you know, call me stupid, but I'm not going to give a vile device that kind of power over me. You can shoot me, put me in a cage. I ain't going there. Not, not certainly not voluntarily. If you want to commit a crime, you just go ahead. See how that, see how that works out for you. And he says this office is charged with the responsibility for seeking judicial enforcement of administrative summonses, which was actually kind of crazy. Uh, so, so far, uh, there has been no judges putting any signatures on anything that I've received so so far. It's worthless attorney douchebags and people who don't have the any kind of authority outside of you know uh, ignorant people that give them that authority. Um, so it, it, he's claiming judicial enforcement, and not only that, he says, I, I mean, you were given a summons, of, you know, that required me to appear. Uh, no, the summons didn't require me to appear because the summons didn't apply to me. So that's a lie. Okay, that's a lie. That's fraud. Okay, so I already know who I'm talking to. Uh, Mr. Price is in a, a perpetual state of criminality. He has no chance of actually understanding the law. Why can I say that? Because a person who exists in a continual state of criminality cannot know the law. Why? Because the singular creator God denies you that when you're in a perpetual state of criminality. I know that as the truth. And anybody who wants to know the truth will have to first reconcile their criminality before they can uh, be atoned. And since lawyers never get to that point, then he will, Mr. Price, will never understand exactly what I'm talking about. So for me to call him up and say, hey, would you like to reconcile this, was actually, I already knew what the answer was. He's an attorney. He can't know the law. Oh, he can know procedure, and he can practice his craft. And he has a license to practice his craft. Now, why does he need a license? A license of permission to uh, uh, break the law. And, you know, he, he's got a license from, it looks like, uh, the tax court bar and the Texas bar. Uh, that's British Accreditation Registry. That is actually out of the city of London, and it gets its permission through the Vatican. So the Vatican says, you have permission to engage in witchcraft, uh, sorcery, which is summoning, right, summoning and conjuring, and necromancy, talking to persons, which are dead corporations, communing with the dead, speaking with the dead. So they wanted me to appear like a ghost. Oh, can't do that, because I've never been able to disappear. Okay, so, you know, I'm, I, I'm sitting here reading, right? you know, this thing that was sent here. And the reason I called Mr. Price is because on this piece of paper right here, it says, if you have any questions, please contact Revenue Officer Ronald G. Forster. Well, see, I've already, well, and, and it says at this, uh, at the phone number, and, and, and that is 512-339-5323. And if you guys out there want to call him up and ask him why he's a worthless douchebag, you just go right ahead. I just, I just love that. I'm sure he'd really appreciate that. And me, I'd, I'd consider it a personal favor. He says, you are also welcome to contact attorney Anthony Daniel N. Price, or attorney Daniel N. Price by telephone at 512-499-5281. Or by mail. Okay. So, uh, here's two guys who said, we will answer you. If I have any questions. Well, they didn't actually say they were going to answer it. They just said to call them if I had questions. Well, I had questions. But they didn't actually say that they were going to answer it. So they were actually telling the truth. And guess what? I called, uh, uh, Mr. Price called me yesterday and didn't answer any questions. In fact, again, he thought it was just a matter of a tax, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's a tax resistor, when really I was questioning the fundamental authority by which they do their business, which is a little bit deeper question than 
uh, you know, taxes. So, you know, and he, he says, well, I'm not going to discuss this over the phone. And I says, you know what? You're right. I, I think that's right. I, I, he says, when can we meet? I'd like to talk to you about this directly. And he says, oh, well, I'll be happy to, to uh, talk to you after your next court or uh, your next hearing date on, on the 12th of December. And I says, no, I'm not going there. And he says, well, if you don't do... And, and he made it a point to say, but the federal government of the United States is going to come and arrest you. And I says, well, you know, if that actually gets me to somebody that can answer my questions, and I guess that's just part of the process that has to happen. Now, that sort of put him, put him out. And he says, well, the Supreme Court of the United States has determined that Taxes are a necessary part of civilized society. I really didn't have a problem with that. That had nothing to do with me. So I said to him, he says, okay, well, there it is. There's the clue. You said civilized society. Civilized meaning it's a function of a contract. So we have a social contract here. Now, the, the thing with a social contract, or a contract in general, is uh, people can't be forced into that contract. Okay? It's a function of a contract, and all contracts are willing. I says, am I right? No response from him. And he says, Mr. Poole, you're going to listen to what I say, or I'm going to ter terminate this phone call. And I says, well, hey, let's try this. And I hung up the phone. That will be the last time I talk to Mr. Price. Unless, of course, a crime is going to be committed. If I see Ronald Forster in my environment, or Mr. Price in my environment, for any reason, it is a crime, and against my will. That man failed to answer my questions, when apparently his process dictates that he must avail himself for those questions. I'm certainly not going to ask Mr. Ronald Forster a question, because this man is a blasphemer. Why? Because he puts man's, God, uh, man's law over the singular creator God of nature. That is blasphemy. It violates the law. Rule 1, commandment 1, and this is why it's first, have no other gods before me. These men attempt to use man's law to usurp natural law and divine law that which flows from the singular creator God of this universe. That's blasphemy. And I don't need to place an abomination in front of me. And if this abomination wants to place himself in front of me, it's against my will and therefore is a crime. The summons itself was delivered as a function of an entrapment, which is a violation of their own procedure, they failed in their duty to properly notify me, properly instruct me as to how I was voluntarily placing myself under their jurisdiction when I had not done so, and I had not agreed to any contract that was enforceable. It's not a matter of me not understanding the law. I know the law. I understand the applicability of procedure. I call the question that you are misapplying the law. You are misapplying procedure. You have committed a crime through that misapplication of, uh, of that procedure, and you have failed to remedy that breach. Now, wow. A deprivation of due process. The inability to actually get any substantive response from the people who do that. So let's go and re revisit this idea of um, taxes being a necessary part of civilized society. You know, actually, I, I actually agree with that. I do. I, I do believe that we all, I I if we want to have a civilized society and we need things as a group, that I think, yes, a a every man who is, is civilized uh, should be able to contribute what he can. However, if I don't own anything, 
and I don't. These people want to take all of my garbage to pay off some obligation they say I have under authority that they haven't demonstrated. Well, I don't have any stuff, folks. I mean, if you take this garbage around here, I mean, I, I think you'd be surprised. Uh, I, 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 it, it would take a lot of work to actually get 10, 10 grand out of it. And it's going to do nothing to pay whatever, you know, perceptual obligation they, they think I have to them. It's a waste of, I, I mean, it's just, it, it's just an absurd notion. And I said, you know, you know, quite frankly, if you can do that, then it's quite frankly not my property in the first place. It's not my property to give. Your property, apparently. And my participation in a civilized society, my willing participation into a social contract called society itself, apparently is compelled. It's not voluntary. And if it's compelled, it's not civilized. It's criminal. We don't have civilized society. We have criminal society. That's what we have. And the fact is, because I was just simply born... That some man walks up and says, you're my property, you do what I tell you to do. Because you were born, you have the audacity and gall to exist. So therefore, you're mine and I will you know, make you do what I tell you to do. Anytime I want, because you have the, the, the gall to be alive. No, you don't get any food. No, you have no freedom. Because you're, you're alive. How dare you? And the absurd notion is, these guys already have taken everything. I've been working in seven months. I can't even get a job. They put some sort of rock on, uh, 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 you know. They do get any kind of background check, of course. You know, I... There's no way to meet obligations if you can't. And, and okay, let's say I can get a job, right? They take 90% of my labor, my property, 90%, leaving me insufficient amount to even go back and forth to the, the, the job in the first place and feed myself at the same time. I haven't even started my car in months, man. I got nothing. See, what they want is me. They want my obedience, and they want me to feel obligated to them. They want me to give them power over me. And that's the only thing I am not going to give them, and I don't care what they do. Take all of this fucking garbage. Put me in jail. Beat me. Just, you know. However, I think it's kind of an odd notion that I've got treasury agents to tell me that due process does not apply into the system, but here we are with this procedural puppet show. Why bother? Why didn't the treasury agents just haul me out of there in handcuffs? Why don't they answer any questions? I'll tell you why. Because I'm right, and they know I'm right. And they are nothing more than criminals. And they've been criminals for a long, long time. What did they do to David Koresh? They murdered a witness to a crime and swept that whole thing under the carpet. I witnessed the crime too. And they say that their procedure that permits them to do these kinds of things supersedes that of the singular creator God of nature. I don't think I have as, uh, I don't think that they have as much problem with my philosophy as I do with theirs. My philosophy is not to be in a perpetual state of, you know, criminality. That's my philosophy. Their philosophy is something else. You know, 
it's <sighs> blasphemy. There are abominations before, and, and you wonder why, you know, why am I unhappy? Well, you know, back in 1993, I saw all of this going on, and you know what? I didn't care. Really didn't care what some kook and his, and his group of religious fanatics were doing in Waco. I actually thought it was a good idea. You know, I believe the lie. But something really disgusting happened. I swept it under the carpet and I let it. And I thought that, hey, I was going to go on and, and, and be happy after that. Until I actually saw what happened and I thought, oh my gosh, look what I have done. I've told the government that it's okay for them to kill me anytime. And nobody is, nobody's acting to change that. Oh yeah, we stand out in the street and we protest. What are we really protesting? Oh, those other guys are taking, you know, taking our stuff from us. Why? Why? Why are they doing it? They're not taking it from us. We're giving it to them. We commit crimes against ourselves. I committed a crime against myself. I said it was okay to murder 85 children. Now, I can't speak to the Ludlow Massacre because I wasn't born then. However, Waco happened when I was alive and conscious. Other people who weren't going to, to sweep it under the carpet... Find out what happened to them. Find out what happened to Sonny Bono. The truth is out there now about Sonny Bono. He wouldn't let it be swept under the carpet. And I think the people that were actually largely responsible to that are still walking around free. Respected elder statesmen. Yep. So, folks, if society, if this society that supposedly I'm being forced to be a member of is a society that exists in a continual state of criminality, then I shouldn't be here. I'm asking sincere questions about myself. I'm, I'm saying that if I simply accept what exists here is civilized society or civilization, then I'm out of my mind. Because I could see plainly that what we have here is not civilization. It's compelled. It's criminal. It's not civilization. It's criminalization. I'm, we are being forced. The fact that you are being born, somebody comes up and says, you are my slave. You are my livestock. I own you, and I own all your property. And I let it happen. Now, I regret that error. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I will try. More than that, I will not do it again. And what created this situation that I'm going through right now is one day I said, no, I'm not going to be a criminal. I'm not going to commit a crime against myself continually. And wow, when I stopped doing that, I met what was revealed to me when I did that was the singular creator God of the universe. And I'm no longer afraid of little men with guns and pieces of paper that say nothing about anything. Can you forgive me for that?
I'm Roach. In the wood shop. Don't know what's going to happen. Have no plans. I am not a member of society. You have a good day.